Okay, I think let's go ahead and get started. And if people, more people join us, that's great. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, um, depending on where you're calling in. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for the REC-sponsored global information session on reverse logistics. My name is Catherine Ely, and I am the project lead for the, uh, the REC project. I hear some background noise. Hello. If you've just joined us, please mute your microphone, please. Um, so as we get started, um, this is a global information session on reverse logistics. My name is Catherine Ely, and I am the, the project lead for the REC project. Now, the REC stands for Waste Management and Measuring, Reverse Logistics, Environmentally Sustainable Procurement and Transport, and Circular Economy. So it's quite a long acronym, but we call it the REC. Um, just to give you a brief overview of what we do and what we focus on as, uh, as the REC project, it's sponsored, it's uh, led by the Global Logistics Cluster, but it's with a coalition uh, of other partners, including the Danish Refugee Council, IFRC, Save the Children, and WFP. And what we do is we really try and focus on waste and greenhouse gas emissions to try and improve awareness in the humanitarian supply chain community about environmental, art, environmental impact and support logistics practitioners with a reduction of our impact on the environment. Um, our ultimate goal is to have sustained adoption of best environmental practices across the humanitarian community. And as part of that, we like to sponsor a number of uh, global information sessions, coordination groups, et cetera, to make sure that all of you lovely people that have joined us here today are able to have a forum to share your best practices, challenges, um, and we can learn from each other and have a reduced impact on the environment. So um, I think next slide. Uh, with that, I am going to hand over now to Michaela. Michaela is our um, environmental specialist on circular economy. Hello. So, Michaela, over to you. Thanks, Catherine, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, welcome to this first global info session on reverse logistics. Today, we are going to talk uh, a little bit about the uh, definition and the approaches, what circular economy circular economy is and what is a reverse logistic. We'll hear some stories from the field and some academic knowledge from uh, our colleague, the Professor Kovacs from the uh, Hankin School of Economics. We'll have also an interactive session to hear your voices uh, and uh, with a breakout uh, uh, group and some mentee. Thank and you. then we'll hear also from our colleagues from procurement and uh, end of life uh, um, point of view, uh, how we can apply reverse logistics. And we have time for Q&A at the end. I would like just to remind that this is meant to be a very interactive session. And we want the main goal of this session is for sure to provide uh, some guidance and some definition, but also to hear from you, to hear your stories, your challenges, your doubts. So please um, be very in, um, engaged and uh, don't hesitate to, to write in the chat or to raise your hand at the end. Uh, let's see first together what circular economy means and how it's connected to reverse logistics. We need to think that the circular economy is more the model that we must strive for and is a model of production and consumption which reduces material use and redesign products and services to be less resource intensive. This means that now, at the, at the moment, we are mainly using a linear model, linear economy model, where we extract, we produce, we purchase, we use, and we dispose at the end of this uh, linear economy model. But we understand that this is not sustainable because the resources in this uh, uh, planet are not infinite. So we need to strive for and we need to start to adopt this circular economy model that for sure keep the, the same products, the same material in the same loop, maintaining the value of the products and the material, and also for sure uh, decreasing the negative impact on the environment. This talk, uh, we are talking about decreasing greenhouse gas emission, decreasing the extraction and the, the pollution, uh, decreasing uh, the uh, amount of waste at the end of our supply chain, and so on. And uh, so this is the model, the circular economy model. And the reverse logistic is one of the tools, is one of the processes that we can apply to implement circular economy model. Um, but it's not the only for the only one for sure. Let's dive 
into the definition and the approach of a reverse logistic. So a reverse logistic is a supply chain management process involving the flow of materials from the point of consumption back to any step to the supply chain of the supply chain to recapture value, redistribute, resell, or properly dispose of material. Let's uh, have a more a visual idea of what reverse logistic means. Now, this definition, what means? So here we can see the first row that is a forward logistic uh, uh, flow uh, that represents what I was mentioning before, that is linear model of, uh, of, uh, of consumption where we extract resources, we design, we make, we distribute, we use, and at the end, we simply dispose it. Applying reverse logistic, we can keep the material after usage, bring him back to any step uh, of the supply chain backwards uh, through return and through, through this reverse logistic and uh, reusing, repairing, recycle the same material and to redistribute them again or to remanufacture and to redistribute again. Again, here, I think this visual is very useful to understand also the linkage between the reverse logistics, so to bring back to any steps uh, backwards to the supply, uh, to the logistic flow, and also the connection with the circular economy, because we see this circle, this uh, closed loop to maintain the value within this loop. Um, there is then, you can see also a return to dispose. Uh, this is a specific case of reverse logistic, and is when, for example, after usage, we don't have any facility able to properly dispose a material or a product, and we need to send it back, backwards to the uh, supply chain flow, to the logistic flows, to uh, properly dispose where the facility um, are available. A lot of uh, definition, I know it seems a little bit confusing, but uh, here I would like to see some practical examples and to see how practically we can apply or where already you are applying reverse logistics. At REC, we identified three categories uh, where uh, to apply the reverse logistics. The first one is for value item recovery. So, for example, when we uh, decide to reuse, refurbish, remanufacture, repurpose or recycle items. Few examples are reusable packaging or reusable pallets that once we arrive to the distribution point at the end and the pallet, the, the, I mean, we use that pallet. If it's still in good condition, we can bring it back to any step and we can reuse it again. We can reput it again in the same circle of the, of the logistic flow and we can reuse it over and over again in this closed loop. But we can think also about uh, laptops that can go back uh, to the remanufacture plant uh, to be refurbished or remanufactured. We can talk about also um, materials, for example, products that can be repurposed after usage and comes to my mind, for example, tires that we don't use it anymore and uh, after that we can bring it back to a specific workshop where it can be repurposed or used for other uh, scopes. The second category. The second category is more related to items that were found faulty, damaged or returned and that need to be brought back again in the supply, in the logistic flow to the suppliers to be fixed or uh, to be again uh, uh, treated, properly treated to again put them in the loop. Or also when we have expired products. Here the focus goes for sure to food or to meds, medicines or to uh, hazardous uh, material where we have, for example, a situation where we cannot properly dispose an hazardous material and we need to bring it back to the logistic flow to a proper facility able to properly dispose it. The last category that we identify is when we have items that are no longer needed, but no, they are not damaged, they are not faulty, so they are in good condition. We can keep using this item. And an example here could be vehicles or any equipment that you use in the office. For example, vehicles that are um, in specific lo remote location and they are not more needed because a project or an operation uh, ends and we can bring the, that vehicle back to the main office of the country to be then be redistributed or we can apply this idea also to all those materials that are still are still uh, 
use, I mean, are still okay, and we can reuse it and we can redistribute them. Um, also, for example, also having machinery, printers, or whatever uh, is still okay. For sure, we are very aware that this is not easy to implement. There are a lot of challenges, but there are a lot of benefits, and we need to focus mainly on benefits, right? The benefits, uh, the main benefits are on the environmental side. Uh, um, this because we decrease drastically the amount of waste at the end. That's the main idea, to decrease the waste, or if we cannot avoid to produce waste, to properly dispose the waste. So to decrease the negative impact on the environment, but also to keep these products uh, in the loop, in the closed loop that we were talking before about, uh, and again, to uh, avoid the, the production of waste, also create advantages for the um, organization in terms of uh, uh, cost, because in the long term, this can create uh, advantages because we save products and we don't need to buy new products at, every time, but also in terms of reputation. This, is, uh, this new approach that we need to, as mentioned before, strive for, you know? we need to adopt uh, this circular idea and uh, this is what the donors are requiring more and more. So it's good for their reputation as well. Uh, and also we can promote local uh, suppliers involving them in this operation of uh, uh, logistic or local recycling. Uh, for sure, there are also challenges, as I mentioned before. First of all, uh, we need to set up the logistic. I mean, uh, these steps to go backwards, we need to make this happen. So there is the need of a lot of organization, a lot of understanding of the operation. We need to track which materials and which products we have at, at which stage of the supply chain. So it's a little bit complex, but it's totally doable. And then there is the need of an initial investment, exactly because we need to rethink a little bit about our logistics. We need to uh, have also some initial investment to do this. Again, let's keep in mind that then in the long term, this investment uh, will give some revenue to, to the organization. Another point that I would like to mention here is that as a challenge is the greenhouse gas emission. This is a really a point of discussion when we talk about reverse logistics, because for sure, if we bring back material, we need to uh, make uh, this happen uh, with trucks or with other vehicles and this increase the uh, greenhouse gas emission. Again, we need to see here the balance between all of these because for sure we create emission, but at the same time, if we keep buying new products, this also create uh, uh, increase the, the emission that we produce. So we need to see the right balance. Last challenge is the change of mindset. And this is one of the main challenges when we talk about this new concept of circular uh, model, because we need to start to think in a different way. It's not easy, but it, it must happen. I stop here. I hope that uh, I didn't give you too much information uh, altogether, but uh, again, there will be chance after in this uh, session to discuss a little bit more and to hear your voices. Now I would like to give the floor to the Professor Yogi Kovacs from the Hanken uh, School of Economics. Um, Yogi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, can I just ask you to come and teach at my university? That was really good as an overview. Uh, if you can go to the next slide already, I, I wanted to just add on to a few things that Mikhail already said. So uh, just keep going one more this at least. Um, just to maybe we put it in bigger picture. If we are talking of reverse logistics, we are talking about so many different issues. And very often people uh, refer to different concepts almost uh, as if they were the same. For example, green logistics and reverse logistics are some, but there are many others. I mean, we've been talking about um, product returns oh, versus uh, the logistics part of it. We've been talking about closed loop supply chains and so forth. I just wanted to show this fairly old scheme of it to say like okay where do we, we talk about what and where do we also have overlaps of concepts so i really like the rack approach to define reverse logistics to begin with it captures a lot of really important elements and it already sets a scene to move forward mind you in your organizations you might be using different terms for the same thing already so maybe just to keep an open mind of like what you are already doing because it was 
not that easy for us either when we went through a lot of interview material from the REC project uh, to see like at which point do you talk about what? Is it just avoidance or is it um, um, re kind of incineration? Is that is it something that we should be considering under reverse logistics or not? Let's go to the next slide, please. So Michaela already went through a lot of different issues of what constitutes returns. Uh, in the REC project, I think when we were interviewing many of you, in fact, who are here today, uh, very easily we went down the route of like waste. And very easily we went down the route of like, OK, well, this is just something that we can't do anything about. And I'm quite aware of the fact that packaging, for example, has had a very separate project impact as well. And there, a lot of the things have been addressed. But maybe also just to again, keep an open mind. Like when you look at the things that you're returning, you are returning a lot. You are returning expiries from your warehouse, especially in the medical sector and the food sector. Um, there are lots of damaged goods, uh, equipment, as Michaela said, also the, even the vehicles. So there are lots of other things that are also coming back that are being addressed uh, already. And maybe a lot more is being done in this sector than what you give yourself credit for. But then to maybe widen a bit also the picture. When we talk about reverse logistics, we tend to focus on what you can even say, like something that goes the wrong way in a one way street. So returns. But a lot more can be done, even in procurement, to say, what shall we deliver in the first place? And what shall we avoid to deliver? These are material choices. These are choices of um, of suppliers. These are choices of uh, products when you say that what is more durable, what is more appropriate, uh, to just really consider what are the right decisions first. There has been so much done in the humanitarian sector in prioritizing deliveries uh, and making sure that you you don't, for example, deliver textiles anymore around the world that they are not needed. So a lot has been done in that sector, which is also actually part of reverse logistics. Now I'm talking about all the organizations that, for example, still collect garments uh, from in, the, in all sorts of countries, but instead of delivering them somewhere where they might not be needed, they have a lot of secondhand shops in their own countries and um, to generate them the money out of those items instead. So that's also kind of one of the things that actually a lot of organizations do, but don't necessarily see under the umbrella of reverse logistics. Maybe you should th think of it because you're very much engaging with secondary markets, with people in various countries, and exactly with this idea of like, if this is not needed in a disaster area, but you can still collect it and generate the money out of it. That was a right decision to not clog up the supply chain to the disaster area, but and yet help, uh, for example, with the recycling of all sorts of textiles and garments, sometimes furniture. You, you tell me what you do. But that's a really important part of what many organizations are actually engaging with, not just the actual collection in a disaster area. But what is what makes it so difficult? I mean, when you talk about anything that we need to collect back or anything that has expired uh, in, in a kit, in a warehouse, expiries can be a nightmare when you say, like, OK, well, product A has expired, but the rest of the kit is still usable. So you unkit, you rekit. The ERP system implications of that is, is of course, one part of it as well. Uh, what typically makes it difficult is that the item doesn't come back in the same shape or form. It doesn't come back in the same package. You cannot modularly put it on a, on a truck. So it, it's not the same kinds of logistical equipment or materials handling equipment that you can use than in, than in the forward supply chain. So that those really have uh, create a lot of logistical problems. There are other things as well. Um, when you say the timing of it, like if something gets broken, you you can't predict it the same way as you can demand. At the same time, if you think of it, isn't the humanitarian area exactly the one that can live with all sorts of random sudden surges of demand because of a disaster, say? So if anyone 
you are the experts in dealing with that. Now, other things that come in, uh, the status of the product when it returns, obviously the majority of the items you're dealing with are broken items, things that need to be maintained or repaired, uh, or things that are not usable. Um, in the medical sphere, you can even think of like all the items that you just really don't want to hit the black market and create additional problems in a situation. So you need to collect pharmaceuticals very often just for that reason. Uh, in the commercial sector, we talk a lot about extended producer responsibility. When we went through the interview data from BRAC, we found that this is sometimes discussed as one of the biggest reasons why uh, organizations do not engage with reverse logistics to say that, well, we kind of don't have to. But is that really true? Because importers, in fact, in many cases, have the same responsibility. And wholesalers do. So as an organization, think of it a bit broader that, you know, even though you're not the producer of an item, as an importer, you might actually face that, even legally. Uh, then one thing that I can imagine and can see also in the data that is a problem is like, how do you plug and play with the existing systems in a country? So like, you know, if a country already collects and has good collection systems for a particular type of material or a particular type of item, how do you work with that? That um, do you really need to set up your own system or do you just kind of like establish processes and connect? It's not an easy one um, in the very first phases of an emergency sometimes. But if you are in a country where you either have like operations every year, you mean you can learn from cyclical operations. You can also learn from very long term operations and a lot of them are long term at the end of the day. Let's go to the next slide, please. I wanted to a bit widen the uh, spectrum of when we are talking about reverse logistics and why we do it and, and the circular economy. So this is a table from the circular economy of like what do you what are the different options that you can do with materials. The RAC approach uh, puts them into more categories. It pretty much if you look at the first column um, goes with the same uh, types of kind of categorizations. But just to again have a bit of like the vocabulary as well of like what are the different things one can do and so forth. This is basically a pyramid if you think of it. So recovering things is typically the last resort. Um, to give you an example, we have huge incineration plants here in Finland and we are generating heat of them for cities, which is great. At the same time, the stuff that we burn, we could really use those raw materials for a lot of other things. So again, I would want to come back that think of like procurement first, and that's on the top of it, if refuse. You don't need to always buy certain types of items. You can rethink which materials you want to have and so forth, okay? What we also found is, and this is a big discussion, we now are starting up a project called Worm. Uh, some of you might be part of it, um, which looks at Again, reverse logistics to a large extent, but waste management in particular as well. There is so much done in the area of bioplastics, but we tend to use bioplastics and biodegradables almost synonymously, and they are not. So not every bioplastic is actually biodegradable or not that easily biodegradable without having particular processes and very specialized processes to it. So be very careful with that. The other thing that we have seen is that many humanitarian organizations, for very good reasons, actually refuse certain types of starch based uh, bioplastics when it comes to undermining food security. So there are bigger implications sometimes at hand. Again, the refuse and rethink is, is a really good place to start with those things. Let's go to the next slide with some examples there. So we went through uh, the data as, as said, and we went through like kind of what is it that we do see. There's lots and lots done in the area of waste management, particularly with regards to waste picking and working with waste pickers, which uh, a really good example has been how uh, the Danish Refugee Council works with Mr. Green Africa um, and educates waste pickers and makes sure that that they are picking certain items and uh, and 
and create value out of those items. Similarly, you have material recovery um, in refugee camps very often. Uh, there are some very good examples we found, for example, how the World Food Program has worked with material recovery and you know, sanitary landfill in Cox Bazar. In both cases, though, we are very much at the bottom of this pyramid of like, you know, better than just uh, still just the landfill and, uh, in many cases, but still we are thinking of recycling, we are thinking of like just addressing the last part of when, it, when something already is based. Uh, Upcycling is kind of a funny thing. Uh, there are quite a lot of examples where people collect waste and make, say, say bags out of it. I have a few handbags like that. They are quite nice and funky. Uh, and you can do that as well, of course. The issue is when we come back to reverse logistics, so there's so much more. I mean, in the warehouse, a lot of things happen. Uh, we do find a lot of managing expiries, uh, examples for segregating waste in the warehouse. Um, we have found a lot of examples for as when facilities, now I'm talking, for example, field hospitals, how they incinerate waste. Um, mind you, there are very tricky questions there as well, if like, you know, which degrees uh, are, are you doing the incineration? Is it safe for people or not? I think, yes, sorry. Uh, I'm going to end quite soon, no worries. One of the things though um, that we found is a really good reason why to engage in um, in reverse logistics are maintenance and repair operations. To the extent that we found an example where IT suppliers were preferred to be coming from the country where you already are in order to not have the problem that you always have to extract all your equipment whenever, say, a laptop doesn't work. So even the warranty is given by them by the importer. And this is to come back to the point that as humanity and organizations are, from a country's perspective, the importers, that warranty sometimes comes with you. But generally, we have very few examples. So even though I, we've dug deep into the data, and these are really good ones and success stories where it worked, um, what are yours? There must be a lot more if you really think about what all is covered under reverse logistics. Back to you, Michaela. Thanks so much, Professor, uh, for for your explanation, for your session, for providing providing these examples. Uh, and uh, I will link exactly to what you just said. There is still so much to learn. And again, this session is meant to hear your voices. So now we'll have a more interactive session where you need to be. Um, uh, I mean, you need to say what uh, what you experience. If you experience something, if you have some um ideas uh, or some practices that you want to share if you don't have any don't worry you simply will listen to the others but again now we will be in several uh, breakout rooms to have a separate discussion and then we'll come back here to see the results a couple of seconds and you should be read directly Okay. No. Hello. Well, I'm, I'm not an expert in, in, in shelters. I'm just an expert in environmental assessment. Um, so I, I lack some knowledge in this, but we have luckily some organizations uh, where we can work with. But also, I think within this group, there are a lot of parties and people who might have uh, answers on my questions. Thanks, uh, Alexandra. I didn't hear all your intervention, but uh, I'm sure that then uh, the facilitator of your working group will uh, report it. Uh, yeah. So we are back uh, all together. Um, let me share my screen again. 
Okay. Here we are. And uh, we'll go to the maybe, next Maybe, part. sorry, Mick, quickly. Yep. Does anybody want to try to give Alex uh, uh, some insights? Like Yongi, did you manage to capture his uh, question? Yeah, I, I did hear the question. I mean, I don't really have insights because if you're lacking the data, that, that, is, that needs to be coming definitely from the, the organizations you're working with. But I do understand the difficulty of getting that data. So, um, not sure any of you who work with shelter uh, or any kind of like um, any any shelter related equipment. Uh, if you could maybe help Alexander to and talk to him, like what kind of data there is that you have on this matter. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay. Um... As the slide uh, say, now we're all ears to hear from what we consolidated all together. Um, I will start with group number one. You want to quickly present? Or I go, I go first. Okay, in my group uh, uh, actually was good because we hear that a lot of organizations are implementing reverse logistics schemes. That's very positive. Uh, and uh, um, when we went to see which kind of categories, the answer were quite balanced. Uh, so we had several examples for each category. We had a short talk about uh, the returning of vehicles when they are not needed anymore or after uh, usage for five or years uh, um, to re be returned and that will be resell, resold or uh, redistributed. Um, we talk also about packaging uh, that is uh, accumulated uh, and uh, um, consolidated to be then again brought to um, uh, suppliers to be reused. Uh, but we talk also briefly about a regulation and uh, uh, the country specific regulation and country specific uh, challenges related to that uh, because uh, there was an example of uh, uh, cereals that uh, was not needed anymore and uh, the organization tried to export this cereal to re redistribute them and there were a lot of issues related to um, re-exporting. So this is something also that we didn't mention before in the challenges, but it's a very good point uh, that we discussed during the working group. OK, I hand over to the next group. Marta, you want to go next? Yeah, uh, yeah in the group two, we were like uh, 11 organizations. Um, the question on uh, if they are implementing or not reverse logistics schemes, the major answer was no, but uh, it may be the case that uh, um, they are already implementing logistics, uh, reverse logistics schemes, but they don't call it like that. So that's also uh, the the possibility of this answer. Um, in terms of the main category of uh, scheme logistics uh, uh, interventions, it are more into the first and the third, so recovery of valuable items, and also uh, transferring or managing the no longer needed items. Um, some examples were on uh, IT uh, laptops and um, that uh, they were um, yeah, planning how to uh, make uh, them reuse or, or repair and not uh, to have to uh, yeah, throw it. Um, and then in terms of the, the question, um, right, the fourth question, that was about um, the type of interventions. The majority of them, they were developing policies at this moment at global level that can be implemented at the field level. Some of the uh, points or issues or challenges uh, is uh, that every country has a very context uh, specific uh, situation. So when it comes to the decide what to do with some items, it depends if that country doesn't have infrastructure is different than a country that have infrastructure and then which is the best balance. So it's transferring into another country or maybe um, uh, donating or there are different uh, other aspects, not only environmental, uh, that can also mm, help to decide uh, what is uh, the best option for these uh, items. 
Um, and uh, yeah, they uh, are also in some cases uh, mapping uh, recycling infrastructures in the country. So the mappings are uh, that are in the logistics cluster are useful also to, to start exploring these options. And in terms of needs, they highlight the need for time, resources, trainings, SOPs and yeah, mappings. So that's a little bit of the summary we had. Thank you, Marta. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. I will uh, leave the floor to the next uh, uh, group. Uh, Basel, the floor is yours. Thank you. So we were classroom number one. Interesting, uh, like results, really, and like on, uh, interesting topics discussed. So does your organization uh, or like implement? We got 50-50 uh, on the implementation of reverse logistic uh, scheme, which is uh, like I think it's positive as well because like at least uh, all like uh, everyone is recognizing the uh, the necessity of uh, like um, implementing a reverse logistic scheme. So. We're happy with this. And uh, for the reverse logistic category, we got uh, reverse logistics value recovery item, like such as reuse, refurbish, and remanufacture. We uh, we got like uh, four answers. And uh, also for the reverse logistic for uh, for found faulty damaged our return, uh, we, we only have one answer, which is none. And uh, the other one was like reverse logistics for items that are not no longer needed. We also got two so um and uh, for the uh, do you think uh, it would be possible to implement or expand uh, we had uh, like several discussions and uh, very very uh, also important comments from uh, from uh, from our participants uh, i'll take you through them like uh, very very briefly uh, one of them is was like also about that we need to realize that uh, it like the re we need to reflect more realistic on the situation because it's not always as we say like uh, like uh, uh, shining stars or roses all over but we have challenges also uh, also in the field such as the co uh, the cost the like the uh, education of the stakeholders and also the reporting back to donors saying that this reverse logistic is not for free uh, yet we have the the uh, the the upfront cost that we need to pay, but on a longer term, we're trying to participate uh, or uh, 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 invest in in uh, in lowering the uh, environmental impact of our operation. Two very important also comments came that it's like we uh, everyone is realizing also the quick win of trying to do reverse logistics in terms of IT equipment and during the procurement phase, uh, a lot can be done uh, during the process uh, to contribute to reverse logistic. And the second one also it, that is require redesigning the product or the terms of uh, reference for the, 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 the reverse logistics during the contractual period, which is also very, very important from procurement perspective. Uh, I guess that's it, Catherine, or um, Thank you. Do you, would you like to add anything? Thank you. Thank you very much, Basel. Last group, Francesca. Yes, hi. So very quickly, uh, yeah, I mean, more or less the same uh, uh, considerations from our participants, except that actually we had a low rate, let's say, of uh, reverse logistics schemes implemented. Let's say uh, the minority of participants indicated that their organizations are doing it. But this is uh, uh, really interesting because actually uh, these are organizations which have a regional presence in many offices in the world and they are like msf is uh, applying uh, recovery of uh, of items since uh, quite a long time so it's interesting to know that some organizations have well established mechanisms while uh, um, for the implementing or could implement let's say that most of our uh, well all of my respondents <laughs> indicated that they see the most the greatest potential in items that are no longer needed but are not damaged so old laptops or any any item that can still have a value within the uh, value chain and should not be disposed of so we will keep continuing with the discussions but uh, i guess that this is starting to be food for thought for the plenary thank you Absolutely, Fra. Uh, and yes, I like also to see some common areas that were discussed uh, in the different groups. So yes, for sure, we'll uh, consolidate all these inputs and uh, we'll share then uh, uh, the results uh, with you uh, at the end of the session. Um, but uh, now let's go to 
the next uh, uh, intervention from our uh, green uh, procurement specialist uh, who will tell us why procurement is so important uh, in uh, implementing reverse logistic. Basel, up to you. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, a very like very very basics. I'm not going to bore you with procurement details. However, we we need to realize that uh, everything starts at the uh, planning phase, and we witnessed that in the field where the more we plan on like more spend more time on the uh, specifying what we need. Of course, not to over specify. We need to allow also some room uh, for the innovation of our service provider by seeing what is available in, in, the, in the field or in the market. So the planning phase is very, very important because it allows you at least to address all the challenges where you can uh, like apply the reverse logistic during the procurement process and then be able to implement after signing the contract. Uh, so like as as we say, like well planned, you are prepared. The vendors also for for like at least show uh, or uh, uh, quote uh, or send their proposal with actually with their experience. And like we as a procurement uh, 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 like practic uh, practitioners also learn about the services at an early stage, so we can also plan our requirement. Aligning stake uh, internal stakeholders, like uh, also it's a very very common issue in the field where. Um, I'm sorry to say most people or most stakeholders, they don't talk to each other and they think that procurement has the magic stick where they can also finish the contract with that, with the, without uh, talking to it or having all these stakeholders, uh, let's say, uh, coordinating together, uh, checking out how we can implement reverse logistic during the, the, uh, the, uh, the contractual or the procurement process. Uh, finding reliable suppliers in a lot of context or in a lot of country offices, if I may say, could be challenging because we also, like every, con uh, every country, is is different than 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 the other, uh, uh, like and 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 sometimes we like you can do that by like several procurement uh, like uh, steps, but yet finding suppliers is uh, like one of the major, uh, if I may say, uh, not issues, but things to be put in like in, in into mind when trying to apply our reverse logistic into any contract we're about to sign. Of course, the contract is the one of the most important steps that mean like because it defines what is the responsibility of our uh, organization and also what is expected from from the supplier. So it's very, very important to be like uh, uh, to mention or to at least to review the contract by uh, by all the stakeholders in a way that we need make sure that we capture all the details. I guess I don't want to, uh, um, uh, uh, to, to repeat what the professor has said but it's like very very important to also uh, like uh, point that contracts are like that it's not only the ink on the on papers like it's actually what uh, is being done on the ground when the service is um, uh, is uh, starts next slide please so how to embed, let's say, or try to embed reverse logistics in the procurement process? Um, most of us, uh, and including myself, uh, when I start any tender, it's like very, very clu uh, crucial to see what is available in the market. So when we, like, let's say, uh, before issuing any tender, we try through our expression of interest to at least touch the water, let's say, how, uh, what are available in the market, how we can address suppliers and how we can find out the suppliers capabilities or supplier expertise in that regard. So you could collect a lot of information without doing any, without providing any commitment from your organization side by simply request uh, uh, or publish an expression of interest where you put your requirement. This is what I'm looking for as an organization. This is what we need to do in terms of reverse logistic. Can you, can't you do it? Well, like, if they need any help from our side, of course, to like make sure that uh, the uh, we we plan we plan further for the service. The evaluation metrics also in the in the or the evaluation process during the bidding process play a major part where you can at least insert some reverse logistic requirement in your tender and like maybe put some percentages on how the supplier can address the reverse logistic requirement. Uh, very, very common, uh, like uh, he, uh, like if I may say, important area where everyone, I'm sure, facing it is that we, most of us uh, in the humanitarian sector, we focus on 
trying to respond to any disaster or respond to any conflict by providing assistance while also we try to cut down the expenses. We know that reverse logistic can be uh, like costly in, in, in a way or another and challenging uh, in, 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 in all contexts, but yet all this, uh, like uh, this um, uh, upfront uh, uh, expense, if I may say, could help on the longer term, uh, um, uh, longer term achievements to show that we're committed to lower the environmental impact from our operation. So as you can see, that's it's it's a one hand cannot clap. We cannot uh, work by ourselves in terms of procurement. We need all the expertise, the technical expertise, and we need to reflect that throughout the entire process. Um, if there is any question, any comment that we can also benefit from, please go ahead. Thank you, yeah. Michaela. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Basel, for the relevant intervention. I think that you mentioned two key points for reverse logistics. First of all, we need to work together. We need some collaboration to set up these new systems in place. And also, we need to plan it in advance, as you said, right, Basel? We need to think about reverse logistics schemes in the procurement phase, where we start to think about our operation. And we need for sure the collaboration also of the programmatic areas. And, but yes, thank you, Basel. Uh, I will ask uh, for all the people that have questions to put it in the chat or to wait for uh, the specific question uh, for uh, uh, Q&A. And I will leave now the floor to my colleague, Marta, which is, uh, who is the um, waste management specialist. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about reverse logistic and end of life management of products. Marta, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michela. Uh, yeah, so from the perspective of uh, end of life phase of the life cycle of any item, um, from this perspective, we consider the reverse logistics schemes as a tool that provide the organizations the capacity to mobilize items on time uh, to be reused, repaired, repurposed, relocated, recycled. So we extend the lifespan of these items and consequently we avoid the generation of waste and we avoid also the contribution to harmful waste management practices that in the low middle middle income in income countries where most of the operations uh, takes place. Um, usually the practices are like dump, so there is no collection waste, so waste is, uh, end up into drains or end up into uh, um, community places and after it's burned with all the uh, harmful uh, consequences that has for the health of the communities. And also, uh, in some cases, it's collected, but it is disposed into landfills that are not really environmentally friendly. Uh, next step, uh, I next slide. Um, so then, uh, from uh, also, I wanted just to share a lot of examples we have seen. But uh, if we look at the supply chain uh, uh, cycle, um, okay, yeah, fine, it's all different display. Um, I just wanted to put some examples where the the reverse logistics schemes can can happen or can um, or in each step which kind of examples and these are only some but there are more no so the procurement already Basel explained how to mainstream these uh, uh, reverse logistics schemes at the procurement level at the plan planification level then at transportation and uh, management um, yeah one important uh, example would be with all the fleet waste that is generated that it has hazardous waste which is important to consider con uh, because it's significantly uh, uh, pol uh, pollutant um, that uh, this can be returned uh, to certified companies to be properly treated locally if possible or if not uh, internationally or in the neighboring countries if there is any uh, company that offers this service. Um, for the warehouse management and inventory uh, management already was mentioned about the pallets that's a very good example uh, that can be returned to warehouses to be reused or repair in case that are broken. Uh, it may be interesting to have a small space to repair some of these pallets uh, or recycled if it's not possible to repair and reuse. Also, the packaging materials is another group of type of items, cardboards, plastics, etc. can be returned to the warehouses, maybe to be reused or mostly to be recycled. Um, and then we have this group of damage or expire or oversupplies items. 
that will require a different type of management because the nature of each item requires different. Uh, and also, if it's damaged, it's not the same that if it's expired or if it's a good that can be uh, replaced in another uh, warehouse or another region of the country. Uh, we talk about food, medicines, uh, machines, non-food items, etc. They can be returned and properly managed. And then in the next slide, we'll go to the last step of the supply chain, where we also have other examples that can be relevant uh, to reduce uh, environmental uh, impacts and health and climate impacts. Uh, it's, um, for instance, some of the release relief items can be a return to be repaired or treated properly, like solar lamps or mobile phones that are hazardous waste. Uh, other packaging items that can be recyclable or not can be collected to be reused, repurposed, recycled. Um, then when we have emergencies uh, and there is a food distribution, hot food distribution, it's important to reinforce the collection of these items at the, the place, at the distribution points, to avoid this kind of uh, generation of waste in a, in a very short time. And finally, uh, when the waste cannot be recovered and cannot be uh, reused or repurposed or recycled, uh, consider if we can link it to existing facilities uh, that uh, or um, yeah, yeah to, to construct or at least to have some kind of uh, environmentally friendly options for this uh, type of waste. Uh, that's all from my side. Uh, we'll go back to you, uh, uh, Michaela. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marta. And thanks for sharing also some uh, practical examples of products uh, that can be uh, reintroduced into the uh, local economy through reverse logistics schemes. Now I would like to repeat myself once again, but because this is extremely important. Uh, I already mentioned it during the session. We need to hear from you. Uh, we, you have time, you can think a little bit uh, more about uh, how you're implementing reverse logistics schemes and if you are implementing these schemes. Uh, is, uh, uh, sure. We mentioned the categories, so you have a little bit of time to think, also maybe to reach out to colleagues uh, and to uh, other country offices or um, the people in charge of these uh, um, concepts and to ask for information and to ask for case studies and please get back us uh, this share these examples with us i put here the email address of the rec uh, and uh, uh, we hope to hear from uh, from you um i would like uh, quickly just to mention just a couple of things before closing the session and to leave the floor to to you again uh, we are preparing a reverse logistic quick guide uh, to recap a little bit what we mentioned today, but also to provide examples already existing and practical uh, tips and suggestions on how to implement reverse logistic in the field. Um, again, I mentioned that uh, we need to hear more examples to introduce in this uh, quick guide. So hopefully it will be very rich of uh, good stories to share with all of you. We'll uh, share uh, the note of uh, the for the records of this uh, session. So if you want to hear again, if you want to see again what has been discussed here, or if you miss something, you can uh, you can see the note for the record and will be shared in a couple of days. And you will receive also a survey on this session. So what what it worked, what it didn't work, if uh, some topics uh, were not, uh, uh, we didn't talk enough about some topics, if you wanted to know more about something uh, that uh, we didn't have time to, to deal with. So please uh, feel free to share your Michaela? feedback. Yes. Just quickly, there's a, a colleague here that has their hand raised. Uh, yes, uh, now we go to questions, so good uh, timing. <laughs> Um, I don't see the Arman, I guess. You want to go ahead? Yeah, yes, yes. It's Palal for uh, the Children. Yeah. Just to contribute. Can, can you simply say last... your organization, please? Uh, it's Palal Arman from uh, Save the Children. Perfect. The emergency you. health unit. Yeah. No, it's just a contribution from the last presentation uh, from the examples. I think one thing I work with the emergency health. One thing that has come out from that that just triggered my mind is the decommissioning of uh, mostly the tents and everything because when you have an outbreak, there's always uh, you're always forced to create temporary structures to handle maybe the outbreaks, maybe cholera, maybe handling Ebola. 
So the bit around reverse logistics is working at a larger scale with the Ministry of Health to bring in to see how then when we do the decommissioning, I worked in the Ebola in uh, West Africa. We had to decommission the whole ETC. I was in this cholera in uh, Malawi. We left earlier, but then we left all the procedures for the Ministry of Health to decommission the tents that were provided by UNICEF and WFP and uh, WHO. So, of course, this then will be repurposed and used in future, which I think is something that can, it's an example, but I think maybe the Ministry of Health we work with might need uh, support from us as organizations. And then that, another one is just a point for this discussion in terms of resources. There is a course I took on ADX, it's from MIT on su sustainable supply chains. I think they are running it again on uh, 11th uh, of this month. It's, it's an holistic one. It covers procurement and all these topics you've added, but more so on the commercial bit, which us as the uh, non-governmental organizations can really extract what is really important for us to implement for the NGOs, more so in, uh, in lower and middle income countries. If you need, I can share that, but I think you guys already have this. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Palal, uh, for uh, your inputs. And yes, it would be great if you could also maybe share the link in the chat box. Thank you. Uh, Carolina also has uh, her hand up. Hi, thanks. Yeah, just um, not really a question to be answered now, but something that I would be very curious to hear about. So I'm Carolina Klinowska from DG Echo, the European Commission. Uh, and uh, of course, we are very interested in, in all these topics as a donor, both from the greening side, but also the logistics policy side. And essentially a question to, to the group um, as to where you would see more research or support needed with regards to reverse logistics. Of course, it's a very wide uh, area, as we've seen today. It cuts across waste management, procurement, uh, and, and so on. But yeah, beyond what uh, the REC project is already doing, what else? Uh, we would be very keen to hear. We will have, you know, our next round of funding coming up. So would be very interested to to insert uh, some things there. There will already be probably a general reference to to reverse logistics, but if we can make it a bit more specific, that would be great. And also for the quick guide, um, we we mentioned in in our group, and then I saw other groups also uh, talking about the cross the issues about the cross border movement of waste. I think it'd be very useful if not already thought about to cover that in the guide. Uh, what can be done, what can't be done? I think most importantly, where the roadblocks are. And I think the global shelter cluster or the joint initiative was starting to work on this. I, I can't remember which one. Apologies, but I think one of the other projects was already looking into this. What are the rules and regulations uh, around that? Thank you. Yes, thanks, uh, Carolina. And uh, just for your information, as mentioned before, at the end, uh, the next following days, we'll share this survey to also ask exactly uh, what is needed uh, uh, from the field to implement uh, reverse logistics scheme. So we'll be happy also to talk uh, with you once we get uh, the results. Um, Julien, you're the next one. I see you. Yeah. Hand. Good morning. Thank you. Sorry, um, I just uh, connected very late, so I didn't actually hear the the first part. Um, just a few comments. Um, uh, I'm Julian. I'm part of the Global Logistics Cluster. I've been working with the Global Cluster for the past 10 years. Before that, I've been Supply Chain Officer with IFRC, and I have actually uh, engaged in procurement in many emergency response as well as in preparedness activities. I've been looking at IFRC, ICRC, um, catalog and trying actually to look at how we can limit the impact of our response on the ground already almost 10 years, 15 years ago now. Um, yeah, a few points. I, I think procurement is key, but I think we need also need to segregate um, the procurement at international level and the capacity of headquarters or more global level to look at green logistics um versus actually local procurement because we all know that we are trying to um, inject as much as possible resources on the local market and i think there is also something that we have the capacity to do at global level but not the capacity to do at local level when the objective is really to inject as much as possible fundings resources in the local market and we might actually find some limitations on the procurement side 
and I was supply chain officer. Procurement is key, uh, but procurement is part of supply chain. And I think programmatic aspects is also need to be taken into consideration. And where there is no possibility actually to do reverse logistics, um, and yeah, re-exporting is is nice. It's a nice idea. Um, based on my past experience, it happens only twice for huge, very costly uh, assets that belongs to government. Otherwise, it usually doesn't happen. First of all, because when you import cargo into the country, you make a donation to the government not to pay taxes. If you want to re-export the cargo, the humanitarian assistance in the country, you need to have a transit status. Otherwise, you need to re-export re and the, the government affected by the crisis will not accept its re-exportation. So that's something that we need to look at because um, either you've been you you're being stopped at the border because you are asking for a transit status of the humanitarian assistance, or you can actually import as a donation. In that case, nothing's going to get out of the country. If there are some leftover, it means in terms of of planning and strategic um, yeah definition, we actually miss something. Uh, sometimes we are trying to come with more, um, and then what do we do with the extra? And I think it's a change in the mindset because we should maybe more look at what is feasible and what could be done at local level rather than bringing things from outside the country. And that can actually limit our actions in terms of green logistics. Um, I, I went into different countries in Africa for the past years. Um, and from my past experience in Haiti in 2010, um, the leftover from the NFIs, for instance, if you took the tarpaulins, um, is very useful for the community, for the affected population. It, it I mean, it looks a bit stupid, but uh, a plastic bag <laughs> or just the packaging of five tarpaulins together, you know, the linear that you have around and the, the tarpaulins itself is used by the community. Um, so it's kind of reverse logistics already, and maybe there are some initiatives where we can look at how this um, leftover from, I mean, the our activity can be maybe used, and I think there are a few activities where people are locally are very creative with that, rather than trying maybe to come up with, with new with new ideas. But yeah, I mean, again, sorry if I point this out. No, 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 uh, absolutely. No, thanks, uh, Ashley. You mentioned a lot of uh, very valid points, and I would like to ask you more and to discuss this more. Unfortunately, uh, the time is over, so the session uh, is uh, the first session uh, is over and we'll end, close it here. But so we'll have a, a follow up session in the coming months again to again share uh, practices and also to keep this uh, conversation open and uh, um, engaging with uh, all of you. Um, thanks again and uh, you. feel free to reach out to us and to ask question and share studies. Thank you okay, so much. Thank you. Thank, you very much. thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank, thank you a lot. Have a good bye. day. Good Thanks for participating. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.